just as adapting to a new life in Manitoba is a family and an individual experience. These are the stories we seek to share. I arrived in Canada as a privately sponsored refugee in the fall of 1989. Our family were fortunate to be selected for resettlement, a new beginning too many refugees around the world are never offered. Beginning life over again in a new country, a new culture, indeed a mosaic of cultures, and facing barriers such as language and a lack of credential recognition and isolation, they all compounded the trauma that comes from displacement. But for those of us who made it, we were welcomed by a new extended family and a chance to start over. I, as a refugee child, am forever grateful for the freedom and the opportunity life in Canada has granted my family and I. As Winnipeg commemorates its 150th anniversary this year, 2024, we remember the role of migrants, immigrants and refugees in shaping this wonderful city. Winnipeg has always been diverse, and this diversity has just increased and made us more resilient, especially over the last 50 years. The people of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, who came here in the, during the flight from the conflict and violent regimes of the 1970s through to the 1990s, are part and parcel of a city which is now truly global. Thank you to the researchers who put this exhibit and this film together and for sharing this important history with all of us. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Dr. Stephanie Petronai Sobe is Associate Professor in Conflict Resolution Studies, a program of Canadian Mennonite University located at the University of Winnipeg and in the Redekop School of Business. She is a leading expert in Southeast Asian dispute resolution processes and has conducted peace building workshops around the world, including in Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand. Her current research includes oral histories of Southeast Asian refugees and European and international policies on refugees and forced migrants. A noted author, she has published books with Emerald Publishing Rutledge and Lexington, Lexington Books. Stephanie served as an expert advisory board member for Asia Pacific Refugee Studies at Auckland University and is currently the president of the Canadian Association for Refugee and Forced Migration Studies. She's the curator of the Hearts of Freedom exhibition that is traveling. Thank you, Dr. Swatsky, for the introduction. It's wonderful to, to see so many friends from various communities here tonight. So by the Capital Manajan, Stephanie Ketsamai Sobi, Capital Ma, Canada, Jack Patate Lao, Pangaloi Pisikal, Don Capital Yangnoi, Kopjai Lai Lai, Kidai Mahuangan, Sedang Kong Exhibition, Kun Opunyok, Jack, Vietnam, Lao, Gap Cambodia. Ko Kop Jai Ki Mahuam Salong Pasat Watsat Kong Canada. I wanted to bring you greetings in my native Lao language in recognition of what this exhibition is celebrating. The stories of Southeast Asian refugees and the legacy that this movement has left our country and the world. Today we have over 230,000 Canadians whose mother tongue is one of Vietnamese Lao or Khmer. Many Southeast Asian refugees also speak French. If you're an immigrant in this country after 1975, you will have been deeply affected by the Southeast Asian refugee movement. Most of Canada's immigration policy stems from that period in time, a time when Canada's nation building practice became the multicultural experience we have embraced. 
First of all, I would like to thank Manitoba Museum, particularly Dorota Winchenka, Tina Hollenberg, Roland Sawaki, and all the staff who has been amazing in supporting the Hearts of Freedom Stories of Southeast Asian Refugees exhibition. They were enthusiastic right from the start. I am thrilled to have Manitoba Museum host the exhibition, sharing it with our community in Winnipeg and Manitoba. It is a province that has been at the forefront in resettlement and private sponsorship of refugees. In fact, MCP Canada, with its Canadian headquarters right here in Manitoba, was the first organization to sign a master agreement with the federal government to privately sponsor refugees in Winnipeg on March 5, 1979, almost exactly 45 years ago. And now that I think of it, we should celebrate that anniversary together with MCC in March. The Hearts of Freedom, the Canadian Southeast Asian Historical Research Project, was initiated by the Vietnamese community and soon expanded to include Laotian and Cambodian communities. They sought to partner with academics to help document their experience of resettlement and settlement in Canada. The researchers are Dr. Colleen Lundy and Alan Moskovich from Carleton University, Michael Malloy and Peter Dekrinsky from the Canadian Historical Society, and uh, myself from Canadian Mennonite University. I am so glad that Mike and Peter have come from Ottawa to be with us tonight. Hearts of Freedom got its name from the Southeast Asian communities themselves. These are their stories their search for freedom from oppression and violence. The project is the most comprehensive multi-year community project to collect and preserve the personal histories of refugees from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia who came to Canada between 1975 and 1985, as well as the stories of the Canadians who assisted them. It documents the lived experiences of refugees through 173 oral history interviews and archival documents to produce four outcomes, a Hearts of Freedom website, a documentary film, a book, and a curriculum. The refugee oral histories were completed between 2019 and 2021 with funding from the Department of Canadian Heritage, IRCC, and the DeFerre Foundation. In addition, I thought it would be exciting to create a museum exhibition that would travel across Canada to the 10 cities where we conducted interviews from Vancouver to Halifax. I created the exhibition with the help of the Hearts of Freedom Museum Exhibition Committee. We began work in 2011 and it was completed in January 2023. The Stories of Southeast Asian Refugees Traveling Museum Exhibition was launched at the Canadian Museum of History in Gatineau in February 2023 with a sold out opening. Then it traveled to British Columbia under the umbrella of PCHC Museum of Migration to SFU, Dental Centre, UBC, St. Matthew's Parish, Greater Victoria Public Library, and Government House before heading to the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 in Halifax in August. In late December, the ex exhibition made its way here to Winnipeg, and our next stop is Edmonton. The tour is made possible through partial funding from CERT and private donors. The exhibition panel follow three themes, escape journey and refugee camps, government policies and sponsorship, and settlement and integration. One of our goals is to showcase successful stories of integration and the many contributions the former refugees are making to their community, Canada, and around the world. The panels are full of photos and quotes that I hope you will find educational and meaningful. Note on the exhibition panel, there are QR codes that will take you to the digital exhibition that follows the same three themes and includes more information and photos. It was created by Mondu Lim, our website designer and former refugee from Cambodia, along with the researchers. The digital exhibition and the website are an incredible resource, including complete interviews from refugees 
along with a few politicians, NGOs, sponsors, and others. Also for this evening, we have artifacts that have been do uh, donated or loaned to us by the Southeast Asian communities in Winnipeg. These artifacts represent and celebrate their culture and include items that tell the stories of their livelihood and escape journey. Be sure to view these artifacts next door to the exhibition. The violence in Vietnam was the public face of the war, but the Lao secret war and the Cambodian genocide were part of the three million people who fled Southeast Asia and resettled in third countries. I am one of the many people here tonight who remember this firsthand. Between 1975 and 1997, Canada resettled 210,000 Southeast Asian refugees, making it the longest and largest resettlement of non-Europeans to Canada. Canadians recognized that they had the ability to help, and they did. They didn't do it because they wanted recognition. They did it because it was the right thing to do, because there was a great need. This moment in Canadian history changed the face of this country. I personally believe this was the real beginning of Canada as a multicultural country, a place whose cultural diversity became an integral part of our identity and our bond to each other. The Heart for Freedom Project is a reminder to a world that is increasingly polarized that our best moments have come with generosity and the breaking down of barriers and that those actions reap rich rewards. This is an incredible story about a remarkable time with amazing people who after 40 years have the ability to share their experiences. Thank you for being here tonight. I hope you leave here with even more appreciation of the value that these and other refugees and immigrants have brought to this country. Thank you. Michael Malloy is a career foreign service officer who served in Tokyo, Beirut, Kampala, Minneapolis, Geneva, Amman, twice, Damascus, and Nairobi. In 1972, he led the selection section of the team Canada sent to Uganda to rescue 6,000 Asians expelled by Indians. From 1976 to 1978, he was director of refugee policy and led the design of the refugee provisions of the 1976 Immigration Act, including the Convention Refugee and Designated Class, and the Private Refugee Sponsorship Program. He was Senior co Coordinator of the 1979-1980 Indo-Chinese Refugee Program that brought 60,000 refugees to Canada. He later served as Canada's Ambassador to Jordan, and Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process. He co-authored Running on Empty, Canada and the Indo-Chinese Refugees, 1975-1980, and has just submitted a second book, Hearts of Freedom, Southeast Asian Refugees in Their Own Words, for publication. Thing is your eyesight. <laughs> well, I'm amazed to see so many people here tonight, amazed but not necessarily surprised. This is the second time Peter and I have traveled here for events of this nature, and I'm here to tell you it's a bit warmer here than the last time. Uh, we're uh, amazed at this museum. We spent most of the day wandering it around it, and this museum has an awful lot to teach other museums about making complicated things accessible. It is such a pleasure to go to a place where you don't have to look under the item or lie down on the ground to be the captain. It is it's, it's just so pleasant to be here. So you, what if you're doing, please keep doing it. I want to also say that last night we had the pleasure 
of the Indian, an amazing concert that is built in Explore of the Olympic Symphony Orchestra. It has been a long time since we've been so inspired by an incredible, incredible orchestra. And I hope you all understand what a treasure it is you have here. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> So my task is to, is to talk a, a little bit about what happened back then that led to this, you know, ultimately led to many of the people in from English and the project we're working on now. Now I'm required to make it short, but I'm Irish, so hold on to your hat. I will speak very quickly, so you have to listen very quickly, okay? Uh, so let's start out at, kind of at the beginning. April 1975. It's very clear in the spring of that year that, the, that Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam are about to uh, fall to the uh, communist insurgency. Canadian government, not too concerned. We have very little relations with, with, with that part of the world. We thought if they become communist country, you know, we know how to deal with them, but we're not too worried. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't be concerned. There should be no impact. Little, little did they know. Uh, because uh, before April was out, a group of Vietnamese students and a number of their, groups of their parents as well traveled from Montreal and assembled on the lawn of Parliament and quite frankly scared the government half to death. There weren't that many of them, but nobody had ever seen people like this on the lawn before. Um, very quickly, it was, de it was determined that they were extremely anxious about what was happening and a meeting was made with Robert Andrews. Uh, the immigration minister at the time, and in the minds of many of us, the best and greatest immigration minister this country ever had. He met with the, the parents while the students stood outside and made a certain amount of noise. And as when he was done, he made two decisions which he conveyed. First of all, all the students and their parents were going to become permanent residents of Canada as quickly as possible. And even before they had that status, they were invited to go to the immigration offices in their community and submit the names of relatives that were still back in Vietnam that they were worried about. The minister said, we will try and get as many of them out of them as we can. Turned out, it wasn't all that easy to do because the last thing to collapse in Vietnam was the exit control. And if you didn't have a passport and you didn't have an exit permit, you couldn't get out. So in response to this, uh, our immigration officer in Hong Kong prepared what were called Thomas's visa letters, and they sent thousands of them to, uh, to Vietnam to be mailed out to people after the dust out. And their letters simply said, you have relatives in Canada, if you can make it to any Canadian diplomatic mission anywhere in the world, present this letter, we'll let you in. Uh, the, uh, the, the students and their families, remarkably, ended up sending us a list of 17,000 names. And those letters kept showing up. 20, 30, 20, 30 years later, these things were still popping up. Uh, they were all sent initially to the beleaguered little Canadian embassy, four people in, uh, in Saigon. And even when they reinforced them, with immigration officers from Hong Kong, there was, there was, there was very little they could do because people if they didn't have the passport, they didn't have the exit permit, there was no point giving them a visa. Uh, now, on, on May the 1st, right after that meeting, which I, I've spoken about, Andrus made uh, an announcement, first of all, that uh, Canada was going to be open to accepting relatives wherever they showed up. And in addition, the immigration department was authorized to take 3,000 people without relatives as convention refugees. Uh, as you probably know, people at that stage who were just escaping as the communists closed in, if they could get away at all, it was easily by sea. Many were turned in from in, in large ships, many of which broke down, some of which were never seen again. It was one thing and another, the Americans rescued about 160, 130,000 people. And another group ended up in Hong Kong on top of a car, um, container ship. Um, we sent, uh, or Andres himself basically uh, ordered a team from, from Hong Kong to go to Guam, where the Americans ultimately took those refugees, 
I don't know if you know where Guam is. It's not at the end of the world, but you can see clearly from there. And and Wake Island. And Wake Island is 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 as far from Guam as Halifax is from Vancouver. And yet one of our officers flew out from, from one to the other, picked up a group of people that the Americans had dropped in Wake Island, and by the time they made their way back, she had them all processed and they left on a plane two days later. So we had some really good people working there. The Americans, after, as, as they realized the monsoon were coming, picked up all those people who, had been in, who were putting Guam and Wake and moved them to camps, military bases across the southern United States. And our team, Canadian, some of the teams were, were in uh, were in Guam, literally followed them across the oceans, and the, the consulates that we had in the States and the roving teams uh, managed to bring 7,000 people to Canada before the year was out. And another 2,000 were brought in in, in, the, in the two years that followed. Uh, now, in this interim, a new immigration act, the first since 1951, was, uh, was proclaimed. And I ended up coming back to Canada after being in various other places. And to my shock, became the director of refugee policy. And one of my tasks, one of my many, many tasks, was to go through that act and pick up things that it said about refugees. Because for the first time, we have legislation that actually mentioned refugees. And among the things that were mentioned was a little thing that said, oh, and you can make rules about sponsoring refugees. Uh, you can make alternate definitions of refugees to the convention <coughs> definition if circumstances uh, require it. And you can actually, you can actually begin to plan instead of just being reactive. And now I'm going to look at the refugee situation of the world at the beginning of the beginning of the year, and we're going to plan how we, how we deal with this. So myself and our team, i.e. Carla Thorison, late Carla Thorison of this very city, designed that program. Carla held the pen with a little help of somebody from Legal Affairs and Settlement and the occasional. I, I, I planned to actually do it myself. And I was thinking about it, thinking about it. And I came home to lunch with him. Carla came in, typical Manitoba. Manitoba. So he said, Mike, this is so and so from Lego, this is so and so from Settlement. We are going to design the sponsorship system. And I said to her, I wanted to do that. And she said, You're the director, just go direct. So, anyways, I sat down, sat him down and said, You know, Uganda, we would get these telegrams saying, if you send my uncle Ahmed to us in Sarnia, we'll look after you. And I said, you know, I said, you can't imagine what an impact that had on us. I said, ah, oh, we don't have to worry about this guy, this family, because somebody in Canada is going to look after him. And I said, that's the impact we've got to have with, it, with what we're designing. It has to be able to, these are all he sees that unless there's something terribly wrong, he is not to worry about the subject because there's somebody else is on the hook for that. So anyways, we got that done. Uh, the idea of the designated classes was some you know, the UN Refugee Convention definition is a powerful tool. If it's outside your country, you've got to have a well-founded fear of persecution and not want to go back. Very, very powerful. But it doesn't cover every circumstance. And as we were briefing one of the officers who asked after things kind of settled down, I thought, am I going to ask this guy to stand on the beach and say to everybody who comes off the boat, you have a well founded fear of persecution? It seemed to sound quite evident. Mm -hmm. Your chances of surviving were two out of three once you got into the boat. Not relevant. So we we wrote a we wrote a definition for that and it reduced the length of the interview time from sixty five to twelve minutes. And when we got Months later, when we talked, we were talking about a very big number coming. That was absolutely critical. Our killer. Don't worry. The government's decided that they're playing persecution. It, that we're taking that burden off your shoulders. So we did that. Uh, in early 1978, the famous correspondence between two of our senior people in immigration said, "Well, it's pretty well over. We're going to see, see a few more families showing up, but we should begin to read it through it." Uh, uh, we just use the, the, the resources we have here. Uh, of course, by the end of 1978, everything they wrote was absolute nonsense uh, because it was very clear it was not over. It was just really beginning. So we have this period, this sort of six week period in late 1978. First of all, a clapped out ship by the name High Hog 
crowd with 2,500 Chinese Vietnamese. But the eggs in the wet bag and a storm and various other things ends up off the coast of Malaysia. The local countries, who already had lots of refugees, said, these people paid for their passage. They can't be refugees. They're just tourists. And the rest of the country, you know, and around the world, everybody was dithery, dithery. The Toronto Star, well, and the classic argument, they say, well, the Canada should persuade Malaysia to take them. Of course, these people could never survive in our climate. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, on behalf of the Irish, we couldn't survive in this climate either. <laughs> Nobody can survive. Uh, so, uh, at the same time, so, so we have these people, and it was Bud Cullen, the minister of the day at that stage, who cut through the crap and basically said, we got to get start getting those people off the boat, that boat, and if we take a, a chunk of them, other people will follow. And so, uh, a guy by the name of Ian Hamilton and three young officers went out and got them. The story of how they got those guys off, those people off those boats and onto land and off to Canada in less than a week is the sort of thing you could make a one-hour TV program. Heroism, guts, all sorts of other things. Absolutely wonderful. It's a great story. We don't have time for today. Uh, but we, if you look, if you read our book, you'll find it there. Uh, the next thing that happened is you, the UNHCR called people to a consultation in Geneva, and many of our senior people went, and they said, look, we have not seen anything like this since the end of World War II. You resettlement countries, have to have to speed up your day. We need we need much more. Uh, same time, the regulations that we were writing to exempt people from those three countries from the refugee definition came out of the regulatory process. So now we got a tool. And then uh, an obscure organization called the Mennonite Center of Community. None of us had heard of them. Sent us a letter saying, "We hear you have a pamphlet or a handout on." Uh, this new sponsorship program. Would you send us a couple of hundred? I think we had 10 printed up at that time. So in any event, so we sent it up with no idea what would happen with it. And then towards the end of the month, when the, when the people came back from that conference in Geneva, it was Geneva, uh, uh, Trudeau's cabinet, Minister Cullen, said, okay, this is getting serious. We'll, and they said to the immigration department, bring home 5,000 people. If you need more, come back. But get onto it right now. So they did. So in January, again, this outfit called the Mennonite Central Committee pitches up in, in Ottawa and we begin negotiating with them. The first national sponsorship agreement was under which they said if things go, if we sponsor people and things go wrong, the Canadian government doesn't have to worry about it, we'll fix it. So that, and they have to wait, we had the two, the two negotiators. Between them, it was love at first sight. These two guys who just looked at each other and liked each other. So very quickly we had an agreement, and as we mentioned already earlier, the first one, the first uh, such agreement was signed in this city in March. Three of the churches jumped on the bandwagon right away, and within two months we had over 300 sponsorships to something like 2,000 people. Just boom, just took off like that. Um, then the Joe Clark government comes in. And we have two remarkable ministers, Flora McDonald, foreign minister, and a guy by the name of Ron Hatton, immigration minister. And these two people had been following the situation. Flora was the world, tra uh, world traveler, and they were deeply concerned. So the first thing they did, as soon as they, they took power, they said, we're, we're on the hook for, for 5,000, that's going up to 8,000. And we would, there's this new sponsorship program, maybe churches and others could handle another 4,000. That's June. Uh, in June as well, we get something like called Operation Lifeline, coming out of a, min a meeting of, a, of an academic in, in downtown Toronto. Uh, somebody, a newspaper picks it up, christens the meeting Operation Lifeline. Within six weeks, there were 60 chapters of Operation Lifeline across the country. An organization there to promote and prepare people to sponsor that. We count in the national capital, of course. The mayor decides they're going to take 4,000 people, hold the meeting. I actually showed up there. We put out 200 chairs. 3,000 people showed up. Uh, just astonishing. 
So there was no question where the Canadian public was. Later that month, Cabinet comes together again and they decide that we, we've got to do something beyond anything we've ever done. So in late uh, 22nd of July, Laura McDonald flies to a meeting that the United Nations Secretary General had called because of the situation, not the UN High Commission, but the Secretary General called in Geneva, and she gets up and she announces that Canada is going to take 50,000 refugees. The breakdown is the 8,000 we've already got in the pipeline, and if Canadian people sponsor 21,000, Government of Canada will break match that with 21,000. And that, if you do the math, that actually comes up to 50,000, strangely enough. Uh, the UN couldn't believe it. The other countries couldn't believe it. Well, the Immigration Department sure as hell couldn't believe it. Uh, I literally, you know, this, this is not this, literally for two days I walked around like this because I just couldn't imagine how we were going to do that. I, I ended up at being coordinated this thing very quickly and was told, uh, you know, you well, a lot of other people are working on it, but you're the guy that's got to, well, I was like, with the minister, who was the, the immigrant, the prime minister, the immigration minister, the deputy minister, the assistant deputy minister, the director general, and five of us in a row, and five of me, but I was the lowest guy on the totem pole responsible for everything. So I was the guy that had to do the fixing. They could think of it, but they had to fix it. Anyways, uh, I just, uh, so I, I, I said, some of you must have reported this. Well, I said, okay, it's, it's the end of July. We've got all of August to prepare, and we can start in September. I get a call from Laura McDonald. Mr. Malloy, we didn't say you could start in a month. You just start now, now, now. Click. So there were, no, there were no planes to be had because the BC cans had all been grounded, and it was the high tourism season. So we, we, we went to the world's most expensive airline, the Royal Canadian Airport, and we bought 11 flights. And we called up our colleagues in Hong Kong and said, what will you do if we send you a flight with 200 seats, 11 of them, every three days, starting next Thursday? And the answer came back, no problem, we'll fill them. So, uh, and they did. On the first flight, 200 people were on the flight when it took off. 201 were on the flight when it landed. A little girl who arrived somewhere out there. And the thing that bedeviled us for the rest of the public was we couldn't count as refugees. She was a Canadian citizen, born on a Canadian animal. And, and when it comes to, well, we're coming to the final numbers here, you'll see why it bothered me. So by October, we had a grand total of 24 officers out in five different offices out there dealing with people in nine different countries, in 70 different refugee camps, in situations where nobody would come to us, we had to go to them. And the stories of officers sleeping on the interview table while the lats went over to the middle of the night, and getting up in the morning, going down with everybody else to have a tea off the war, and in the Vietnamese camp, that camp, great bread and great coffee for, for breakfast, and then you interview till you have to close your eyes, get back up on that table and have another night to do that for four days and go home. Um, so it, it, it was, you know, we throw the term hero around kind of loosely these days, but this was a heroic effort. So anyways, um, we went from bringing about three to 400 a month coming. By October, we were bringing five, 500 a month. And by the time the plane came down, a new unit called the Matching Center, we required, under penalty of death, to make sure that 80% of the people on that flight had sponsors. So they flew up without no sponsors, they landed with sponsors. Uh, and, and by the time we got through, uh, uh, of, of the 60,000 people that would eventually come, about 40,000 were privately sponsored. So, uh, another change of government. Mr. Axworthy of this town comes in, and the first thing he does is throw another 10,000 numbers into it. So now we're talking about 60,000. And that was really easy to accommodate because we had everybody in place, anyways. And we needed those government sponsored refugees to reinforce existing refugee communities. So, 8th of December, I had the great pleasure of coming home on the last flight. I thought this was going to be nice. I'm sitting in first class. I get up. No sooner got up in the air, a little girl 
climbed up on my lap, went to sleep. I didn't get to stand up for the rest of the flight. Anyways, it was great. So, 8 December, Charter 181 arrived in Montreal, bringing me in the last of 60,049 refugees. If that little girl had only been born a day earlier, it would be 60,050. But they stuck with the 49, so that's the reason. Um, the only last thing I'll say is it took a huge effort, a lot of money to bring it back. But those communities have repaid this country in talent and wealth and energy and enthusiasm and really good food. Time and time again. Thank you very much. Peter Duszynski, a retired visa officer, came to Canada in 1957 as an orphaned Hungarian refugee. He joined Canada's Immigration Foreign Service in 1974 and had foreign postings in Paris, Chicago, Cairo, and Budapest. In the early 1980s, he managed the resettlement of Ethiopian refugees in Canada from camps in Sudan. After the fall of communism in Europe, he helped both communist governments establish refugee determination systems in Hungary and Russia. As director of International Liaison, he was responsible for Canada's multilateral relations in international refugee and migration affairs between 98 and 2001. In his last assignment, before retiring in 2005, he coordinated federal provincial relations in the immigration area. He is the co-author of Running on Empty, Canada and the Indian Chinese Refugees, published in 2017. He is a member of the research team of Carleton University's Hearts of Freedom Project and a co-author of Hearts of Freedom Southeast Asian Refugees in their own words. He is a member of the Canadian Immigration Historical Society. I, uh, I guess my presentation will be kind of a footnote on Mike's incredible presentation. Uh, the only thing I can say is that for those of you, and Mike mentioned this in passing, uh, our book, Running an Empty, Canada and the Indo-Chinese Refugees, 1975, 1980, uh, published in 2017, I said that already, is available and since its publication has been an incredible success to such an extent that constantly I'm a researcher and a good one if I may say and like it comes up all over the place academics all over the world are referring to it it's in every library in, in uh, uh, North America definitely but also Europe the number of copies that it has sold both in non paper form and in electronic form, we never expected this. Obviously, it was a well written and well researched book, and virtually everything that Mike has told you is in that book. So, please, if you haven't bought it yet, buy it. Okay? That's one. The second thing I'd like to say, which is not on my prepared notes, but since my kind of didn't do his prepared notes either, what that <laughs> So I'm going to say that this project is a continuation of a continuity since in my sort of life, post work retirement life, started in 2012 when my called three colleagues, none of well, one of whom has something to do with the uh, our South East Asia refugee movement, but the other two definitely did not, together in a cafe on Widow Street in Ottawa, and said, we got to do something. This is undocumented. Ever since then, I learned way more about South East Asia, where I've never been, than I ever expected to learn, 
So then I said, well, please, you know, I'm becoming an expert at this stuff. And the third thing, which has nothing to do with this, this uh, is to say, when Mike said, you know, well, the Vietnamese and the Irish, so how could they get used to this climate? Nobody said, hey, guys, I just had a walk today, a really nice walk beside the river and the Winnipeg way back. And I went two kilometers, and all these, you know, little Winnipeg guys had all their faces covered. So what the heck would you want to cover your face for? So there we go. Anyhow, maybe Hungarians are different, right? <laughs> so, uh, Mike, the act that Mike talked about, the 1976 Immigration Act, had a formal provision for engagement whereby interested persons or organizations could sponsor the admission of members of designated classes. This eventually became the legal basis of the private refugee sponsorship process. Designated other classes referred to special classes of oppressed people, in this case, including Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodian refugees, whom the government could designate as qualifying for refugee status without having to individually meet the criteria of the International Refugee Convention, the UN Refugee Convention. The Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulations under the new Act came into force in February 1978. As the Vietnamese boat people tried to start the city talk, uh, Mike mentioned that in February, we didn't know anything about it yet in Canada. I guess we're a bit late, because it was starting to really heat up from there, and when you look at the statistics, you realize every month virtually during 1978, the numbers started doubling, 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 okay? And both the designated classes and the private sponsorship of refugees were part of the new regulation and of the mecha mechanism whereby Southeast Asia refugees were resettled in Canada. The Indo-Chinese designated class came into force in December of 78, as the refugee crisis was heating up, and it was truly heating up. And as Mike has mentioned, it made us into Canadian media to the high on traitor experience. Uh, and on the 5th of March, 1979, following six weeks of intense negotiations with Immigration Canada, and we were very lucky with the people who negotiated on the immigration side and on the side of the uh, Mennonite Central Committee. Uh, the first agreement was, uh, uh, master agreement they were called, was signed by the Mennonite Central Committee uh, and the federal government. Uh, this obliged the MCC to accept full liability for one year for refugees sponsored by Mennonite congregations. I should mention, I mean, they're their own friends now, I sent them through the process, that uh, Bill Jensen and John Wheeler were on the MCC side, very, very important in bringing this about, both first in negotiating the agreement and then in putting that into practice. Uh, based on this agreement, on this master agreement, other churches and diocese across Canada soon signed similar agreements, and private church sponsorship actually accounted for 39,000 of the 60,000 Southeast Asia refugees resettled in Canada between 1979 and 1980. Now, Mike emphasized it, but this effort of 1979-1980 was about as heroic effort in Canada's refugee processing history as ever happened. And I was one of these efforts back in 1957 when the Hungarian refugees came in, but this one was, was very special. Uh, the Indo-Chinese designated class remained in force until 1997, so gold side. 
during this period, approximately 80,000 of the selected refugees, Southeast Asian refugees, were privately sponsored. As against approximately, again, statistics are very approximate, 65,000 who were government assisted, meaning that roughly 55% of the Southeast Asian refugees resettled in Canada during the life of the Indo-Chinese designated class were privately sponsored. So private sponsorship became absolutely a central part of the Canadian refugee selection and resettlement experience. The personalized help and support private sponsor provided to refugees was a new private sponsorship program defining feature. Although the official private sponsorship undertaking was for one year, many private sponsors continued to assist refugees beyond the first year of the undertaking. Personal ties to private, the private sponsorship program often lasted for many years. For unaccompanied minor refugees, there were a lot of people, children really, under 18 who came in at that time and they needed something. So they were a lot of them adopted and they came in through this private sponsorship provision. And those relationships lasted well, for a lifetime. Now, if you look at the website of the Hearts of Freedom program, you may look at interview number 18 of Chang Button, and this will give you a real feel for how this works and how, how this relationship works two times to the end of it. It's likely about seven times. It's still moderately large. The oral history interviews of the Hearts of Freedom Project are available on the Hearts of Freedom website. This is heartsoffreedom.org, very simple. And I would encourage all of you to get on that website and if you're interested in that, actually listen to these interviews. This is nothing that we can do, and I think especially Stephanie is doing a good job in, in publicizing this, but nothing replaces those interviews. They are very, they're heart wrenching, they're amazing uh, documents, really. Um, they show the importance of a successful private sponsor. For example, the story of Mr. Jen Wen, who is uh, interview and will be talking after me whose interview is interview number 114, uh, demonstrates how the initial help from private sponsors laid the foundation of his family life in Canada. Another example from Western Canada, a very, very striking one really, is Dr. Noon Ram Davis, uh, who arrived in Edmonton. Her number is 141, interview number on the website. Uh, and her sponsor has helped her large family, headed by a widowed mother and six children, uh, for many, many years. To this day, she remains close friends with her sponsor. An important thing that both Vin Wen and Dr. No Grand Davis uh, have story, their story demonstrate, is that sponsored refugees like those who two have made great efforts, still are making great efforts, to repay the efforts that Canada, and especially their private sponsors, have made for them. Both are active in a range of important projects to help refugees who arrived in Canada decades after their arrival. Of course, it was inevitable that not all private refugee sponsorships were successful. The family of Dr. Stephanie Stobie had a very difficult relationship with his private sponsor, who appeared to be so deaf to the needs of refugees, especially the culture, their cultural sensitivities, uh, that traumatized newly arrived refugees require. But her interview number, by the way, if you want to look it up, is 113. Okay? is the living proof 
that you can overcome these things and you know to her curating of this exhibit and the exhibits uh, across Canada are really exemplary. Canada's private refugee sponsorship program started in the midst of 1979, remained in place 44 years later, which is amazing for a the government program. This is an important achievement. Overall, the program has been a lasting success, although in our days, as we discussed with several colleagues, there are issues, okay? Uh, it could be noted that it has opened the door to ordinary Canadians to participate in helping refugees from crisis areas around the world. It has actually provided a very important model for other refugee receiving countries to establish private refugee resettlement programs of their own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greenwood is currently in his sixth year as principal of Gordon Bell High School. Previously, he served for 11 years as principal of Hugh John McDonald School. He started teaching in 1993 at General Wolf School, Donnessy Park, and was a teacher and vice principal at Gordon Bell High School. His passion for service is reflected in his work as a returning officer for the Minto Electoral Division and board member with a number of nonprofit organizations, such as Mennonite Central Committee of Manitoba, the Premier's Advisory Council on Education, Poverty and Citizenship, We to Act Learning Center, Community Education Development Association, City of Winnipeg Waste and Diversion Advisory Committee, and United Way Cabinet. In 2002, he and his wife relocated to the Winnipeg West End with its majestic canopy of trees, where he currently resides with his wife and three children. Together as a family, they enjoy living in a community with a diversity of people groups, experiences, and places in their neighborhood. Thank you so much, Doctor. Well, actually, for the kind invitation. Well, I have to take notes, but uh, thank goodness for technology. I basically re prepare my notes after the two speakers. <laughs> All three were very close friends with me, you know, spent so much time as a executive director of GoCom and I was Pete Domino. And what a pleasure it was to work with you for 11 years. And, and you know what? All four of us before COVID uh, meeting at uh, at GoCom to uh, you know go through the stories of uh, running on empty. And so like before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. And so I'm glad that we're able to gather again. And to see so many faces of friends and families here in Winnipeg, only in Winnipeg, that you were like, oh, I'm just going to go to Venice. And then you end up knowing a third of the people here. So you are very dear to my heart. You are my table folks. So um, if I can just pull up a picture here. Um, I'm going to also pull up, up you four pictures. And yes, this is the most dearest one to me. And my wife can attest to this. It sits by, at my bedside, so I can sometimes see it at night, no, and also in the morning when I wake up. In 2005, our daughter Leanne was born here in, in Winnipeg. And in 2006, I felt it was very important that she goes to meet her great-grandmother, her maternal great-grandmother. That's the only grandmother I know because my paternal grandmother passed away when my dad was very young. I felt it was important to capture this moment because the concept is this, every single of us sitting here are both descendants and ancestors. We receive the stories that were lived in many years before, and we live out and tell the story to the generation to come. So in this particular point in picture here, among the thousand pictures I have, this one is the dearest one. Because my grandmother, Lam Binan, was born in the time of great turmoil. She dawn of the 20th century without the turmoil and all the civil war and the death and deprivation that came with it. And yet at that time, her parents chose to name her Land Banan. And if you know what it means, Banan means peace and prosperity, peace and well-being. How can you have a name like that during a time of terrible, terrible civil war and revolution? And yet that speaks to the resiliency and the hope that we have as human beings. So I hold that dear to my heart. 
my earliest memories were just always, you know, the Vietnamese, we don't have chairs and tables, we just squat beside each other. And so I just squat beside her and just be content and stay in that place. And so this is a story of many generations. And so may my daughter live a long and prosperous life, because then between the two of them, they will get witness to the history and the stories of the 20th century well into the 21st century. I offer that not lightly, but to remind her that stories are important. They resonate with the ages. They tell us what was and what is and what is to come. And so as you tell the audience here, my kinsfolk, of the work done at the, basically the, the sky level, my job is to end up to give out the stories that lived out those policies and legislative practices that you mentioned so much for Mike and, and Peter. April 30, 1975, we had relocated the family to Saigon because we thought it was safer to be in Saigon when the war was about to end. And so shortly after that, when the war was declared over, I still remember being driven back to my tower to the city of New York. And on the road was Bill, you can actually probably, and I told the exhibitor back there that you can outfit entire divisions with all the cast off weapons, tanks, jeeps, coats, and all. That's why when you have the display back there, the two things I saw were the army jacket and the uh, stolen kit. These two items represent for me my parents. My dad served in Auburn as part of the corporal. And he was part of a group that was actually captured and placed in refugee camps. And what I remember about him was that he used to ride a motorcycle and place my brother and I in the front. And when the rain would come, he would wrap his army jacket, similar jacket, and keep us safe. And yet, when he came back, when he was released from the concentration camp, things have changed. And I don't, I didn't really understand why things changed until much later. But I was resentful towards the communist government. I was, I deeply despised and did not like Ho Chi Minh for what his government done to my dad, who deprived me of two years of my father. And so I swore in the family home and took the name in vain. And my dad had the sad look, but yet determined look in his face. He took me aside and in front of my whole entire family slapped me hard in the face. That is the power of an oppressive government and what it can do to people and the families with them. Years later, I understood he did it for the sake of a family because of a neighbor or even within the family would to report that how a whole family would not be safe. So that act of slapping in the face was an act of protection and love that he had to do, which I did not understand at that time, but I do understand now. I understand the pain they had to go through. The sewing kit is my mother, my indomitable mother, who basically was for a number of years, two years with her husband, with four, three kids that she had to raise. And I made the mistake of running across without looking and was ran over by a motorcycle. And I stand here by the greatest goodwill that I survived. But I still remember her riding along in a moped with uh, my neighbor with me to the hospital not knowing whether or not her oldest son could survive. And yet, through all that hard pain and pain, she was able to put together the economic capital necessary so that we could leave. Yeah, the case can be made that we paid for it, but it was an entire life saving that we had to give in order to get on those rickety boats, 202 meters, that like, contain 202 people, keep to down for five days and four nights. And so we arrived in Malaysia and through a series of refugee camps. And finally, we sat across from those interview officers that you mentioned. Thank goodness that you made it I'm sure that it was only 12 minutes. But it was a long 12 minutes. And it was interesting, two thoughts came to mind when, uh, when we spoke about that. And it's like, man, you know, the Norwegians came, the English came, the, you know, the uh, French came, they all, you know, suits and ties, the Canadian guys wearing Bermuda shirts and shirts and scruffing. So two things came to mind. I think, wow. Well, they must be a very generous people because even though they're so poor, they won't kick us in. <laughs> and they so much be so generous and warm because we hear that, you know, the, 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 the 
kid in the back of the cab, you just pee wherever you want. You didn't have to go up there, but apparently you, you pee, you, it's pleasing before touching that. That's the ground, right? <laughs> so if you got all that against you, but you're still willing to, you know, all the onset, we're just so thankful. So thank you for the generosity of Kenny because we did fly over here. Thanks for making that, uh, you know, the, uh, the flight there, uh, Mike and Peter, because I still remember that piece of meat that I ate. Oh man, it was so good. Protein, protein. Yeah. Back in the days when you can actually have like real cutlery when you actually cut the meat. So we arrived. And so, next to picture, please. So I asked about more hotel for the opportunity about eight years ago to take a picture for this window because I remember this window of the tower and looking out to it because I could not explain my feelings, but I think I could say this. There was a sense of wonder of the world before me. And I was so thankful for that, but I could not express it. But in hindsight, 40 years later, I would say to you this, that glimpse out the window for me was basically those wondering questions that is actually now reflected in the Natural Education Mamata Wishan document, which is the good life. Identity, where did I come from? Who am I? Purpose, what is my purpose? Access of opportunity, why am I here? And destination, where am I going? For short for the digital generation, I call that iPad. Identity, purpose, access of opportunity and destination. So after this, uh, we left and basically took the Greyhound bus from Winnipeg to uh, Brandon. And through that time, it was early November, by the way, so I'm glad that we were not the last, but we're not the first either. And it was a very interesting landscape. And my uncle, tongue in cheek, said, you know, uh, we watch a lot of Russian films, communist films. This looks like a lot like that uh, Cossack charge down Siberia. Which one of you said something wrong here for us to be here? <laughs> and yet the most uh, crucial comment that my dad made was he looked out the window and never seen snow before and seen, and he used the term that those of you didn't even understand this, were two laggards between in the fall to the Easter fall. And uh, we hold on to that. My dad has now passed. But for us, really was his way of saying, uh, a life is ended. And we're about to be involved in something new, something that is quite exciting, and we are thankful for that. So we arrived in Burdo, uh, eventually, and one of the places that I was very mindful was we did a big sponsorship, uh, our sponsor, who lived in this really grand building. And then there was a living quarter, but there were many, many just torn down just rooms, and I went through it. I couldn't figure out, but there's such a sadness in that building. 30 years later, with my VP, who at Gordon Bell, who led me, uh, Miss Audrey Dysart, bless her, as she's passed on, she taught me a lot. And I shared that story with her. She said, Jim, you visited a Dota residential school. I guess that you heard the sound of the children crying. Yeah. And so throughout those years, I remember as I, I have a role to play, just as I've been given much. I also have a role to play in terms of the wealth and the health and well-being of all natural and Koreans. And that is why I am where I am today. 31 years later, 31 years of service in, in the Winnipeg School Division, you'll find in my heart four chambers. General Wolf, Shaughnessy, Keith John, and Gordon Bell, all within a stone throw of where I started. So I'm not a war traveler. You, you sent me on a journey from Southeast Asia to here, and apparently I'm here for the last 42 years, and I'm not going anywhere, because I'm married to a good Mennonite woman from Liverpool, and so, so 1979 and 1874 coming together. The MCC agreement never realized that when you put that in place. And now you have many metal sheen running around. Our family was able to finally settle in Russell, and Dad did it well. The stories of many of us, Vietnamese, Chinese, Hungarian, he worked a highway job through Monday to Friday. After work, he did the lawn in our subsidized housing, and Saturday, Sunday, he worked in a Chinese restaurant. That was the skill necessary. And then he eventually bought a restaurant in Rockton. And it wasn't a good place because it was two very separate communities. You know, the Caucasian Committee in Rockton and the Ojibwe in Way was the capital, and they didn't cross. And when they did, it was in the best of circumstances. To get to know where they actually met and we were deep in teams with each other, it was an MNL restaurant. We don't own it anymore, so 
I'm not promoting anything like that. But I would just tell people because ten years, we were the bridge. We were the bridge because we served good food. We were the bridge to say we are all human beings. We are the same treat each other. Come, come and have your one time meal soup. Sunday is Chinese food, and Mother's Day is the busiest day of the year. We all have fun eating, but I'm working like a dog. Right? But that is where, as human beings, we come together. That is where we start to build a reconciliation, and that is where newcomers like us can bring that perspective in and say, what had happened in this country was not always the best, but we can work to be the best. So I was sent to school here in Winnipeg in grade eleven. I've never left, and I'm here grade seven until now. And as we intend with this forty-fourth year, know this. Know that my family and I, like so many of our um, Vietnamese, Chinese, Khmer, Cambodian, Laotians, Thai, we understand deeply the debt that we have incurred, and we are reminded that tears don't flow up. They flow downwards. They continue. We shed those tears of joy. We shed those tears of grief. And we're very mindful. We're very mindful that the work of healing comes from the telling of stories. Next one, please. I was in the uh, Minneapolis, where the artist Tio Nguyen uh, did some work here in terms of telling the stories of the Vietnam Peace Project. And this was one of his artworks in a stack of papers. Do you remember? Do you, do you recognize what those numbers represent? Okay. 5,820, 220 servicemen in the U.S. died or were missing in Vietnam. The wall in Washington, D.C. recognized the honor them. You recognize all those empty, empty stacks? Next one. There's no name to them. But it represents over two million Vietnamese citizens who perished, or 1.35 million North and South Vietnamese soldiers who died. We can get into semantic and say, well, it's the Vietnam War, the American War, whatever it is, but I'll tell you, it was a civil war. It was a war that not our own making. It was a war where brothers against brothers, sisters against sister, sister. Community against community. Even in my own family, you don't fix. That's where all the communist relatives are, where they are then. But what separated was only one generation. And so, right now, in the deeply unpeace that we are in right now, all of the more reason for us to be reminded of our common humanity, all the more reason to recognize that we're all human, we have to share humanity. And it is through stories like Hearts of Freedom that we tell our stories and retell our story and live our story in a good way, in a kind way, so that we're reminded that things can get better. It must get better. So now the stories 43 years later is representing Calgary, Winnipeg, Ottawa, because my parents have both passed. They've given the choice of the four children. And because of the work and the generosity of Canadians, you have an FAS specialists working in energy. Yes, they're working on oil, but they're also working in green energy as well. It's not an either or thing. It's oil right now and green energy sooner or later. That's what we do. You have a civil servant who is a principal or first teacher in Winnipeg School Division, who is in his 31st year and looking towards a sunset, a good sunset, whatever that looks like. You have a director working at the agricultural community. He took agriculture because apparently she gets to come back to Manitoba and visit all her relatives with these. And you have a director of the Bank of Canada. That are the tangible ways in which those 60,000 Vietnamese and Cambodians and Laotian and Chinese have contributed to Canadian society. Know that we hold that privilege not lightly, but tightly to our heart. So here are my two closing thoughts to the question of. And I put this before those of us who are part of that group that was privileged to be here. What is our responsibility for the peace and well being of our new homeland? First thought when we are generous individually and collectively, we transform the hearts and minds of people, and by extension, the culture, systems, and places where we are situated. 
And that's what the hearts of freedom is endeavoring and will continue to do. So let us be of good courage and go forth with brave hearts to create, tell, and live our stories of generosity and kinship that will make the world a better place. So, Sister Stephanie, I'm glad that you're leaving at 113 and I'm 114. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for your heartfelt uh, story. The next part of our evening has an interesting story behind it. When we were planning for the closing events in BC at Victoria Government House, uh, someone uh, heard that my husband, Carl Stoby, was a violinist. And Lieutenant Governor uh, Janet Austin is a classic uh, music lover. And so someone asked if he would be willing to uh, play at the event. And so then we had to go searching to find something appropriate for Carl to play. Carl is a friend of Vivian Fung, a wonderful Canadian composer. He wrote to her and asked if she had anything for solo violin that he can play for this event. Vivian then replied, Carl, my family escaped and survived the Cambodian genocide, and I'm back in November to research music for an opera I'm writing about their experience. This was one of those wow moments. We had no idea of her family history before this. So she sent Carl a piece that was written for a solo arhu, an Asian instrument, which is very similar to a violin. So this is Silhouette by Vivian Fung, uh, which will be performed by my husband, Carl Stoby, Associate Concertmaster of Winnipeg Symphony and Concertmaster of the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra. <laughs>
thank you, Carl, for the beautiful performance. Now, the next uh, part of uh, this evening, this is the last part, we're going to give you a sneak preview of our upcoming events, and that is the screening of our film documentary called Passage to Freedom. So Passage to Freedom features powerful oral histories of Southeast Asian refugees that made the dangerous uh, journey from Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam to Canada. The film effectively weaves archival clips of news stories, wartime footage, and interviews with former refugees and Canadian immigration officials. The Canadian response to the refugee crisis was recognized internationally with the UNHCR Nansen Medal in 1986. The 50-minute film delves into the journey of the refugees' integration into the fabric of Canadian life and highlights the contributions of this first generation and their descendants. The film is directed and produced by Sheila Ketchel, a former CBC executive producer. We will be screening the 50-minute film on March 1st at 7 p.m. at the Manitoba Museum Theatre here, followed by a Q&A with the producer, researchers, and community people. We hope that you will come back for the film screening as it will be open to the public. Please watch a two-minute trailer of the film. For millions of Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Laotians, the Vietnam War and its aftermath was a time of unimaginable dislocation and terror. From that time, I mean, my family were completely destroyed. We were then never to be sent again. Between 1975 and 1985, some 2 million Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Malchians fled their countries, making harrowing escapes by boat or overland. Au lieu de d'aller vers la la côte malaisienne, on a descendu comme ça plus plus au sud, plus au sud, et on s'est perdu euh, complètement. Only to end up in desperate refugee camps. We lived in a hut, and uh, the hut had no walls, so basically just a thatch roof, and so our parents had to build the hut for uh, for our family. Some 200,000 of them would eventually, miraculously, make it to Canada. In the meantime, we are seeing on the television these images of boats turning over, boats capsizing, and people in the water. We know that people are drowning and dying, and, and people across the country are seeing this too. And, and people are beginning to ask, well, you know, we're doing something, but are we doing enough? that ends our presentations. Thank you to all our presenters this evening. Uh, now please join us again in Festival Hall if you haven't already seen the exhibit or if you want to see more. Uh, we, have, we also have a few uh, tables of special artifacts below for the evening. Uh, Mike, uh, Stephanie, and Peter will all be in the exhibit uh, to discuss or answer any questions you might have. Um, the exhibit will be at the Manitoba Museum until April 7th. So please tell your friends and family and have them drop by. It is uh, free to go into. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening and enjoy the rest of your time here tonight.